I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of Tech Field Day. We're here in Austin, Texas with Platform 9 Systems. Around the table are a group of independent writers and speakers who specialize in enterprise technology. They've been brought in from around the world to ask questions and learn about this technology. To find out more about Tech Field Day, go to techfieldday.com. And to see more videos like this, go to youtube.com slash techfieldday. Online. To wrap up our uh, presentation content, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about all of the work that goes on behind the scenes at the engineering team to bring to our customers all of the products that we just saw. So our DNA is that of a distributed systems company. We don't, um, we don't build or sell shrink wrap software. We don't uh, build on top of a professional services organization. We provide SaaS managed products. Now we proved this out over the last couple of years with our managed OpenStack offering. Uh, we've repeated that model with managed Kubernetes. And we've gotten to the point where we can deliver these kind of uh, cloud infrastructure frameworks as SaaS products uh, fairly quickly. So our delivery model productizes these kind of scale out open source frameworks. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of the, the tooling that goes behind all of these um, delivery models. So all of us have tried, I know you alluded to trying to set up an OpenStack install and uh, the pain that you had to go through to do it. This is essentially what our operations team does to create a new control plane, whether that is for KVM with OpenStack, VMware with OpenStack, AWS with OpenStack now, or Kubernetes. So the few clicks, they can choose where they want to deploy the control plane, what, what flavor they want, as well as what features they want to turn on. Once they've deployed the control plane, we have our whistleblower service, which gives us a view of all of the various events that could be going on with all of our customers across the globe. So the whistleblower service is what sifts through all of the, the various events we can find. Um, it categorizes them, it uh, prioritizes them appropriately, um, tries to reduce as much of the noise as it can, and presents this kind of a dashboard to our, uh, our support team. It also provides as many contextual cues as it can in terms of uh, logs or stack traces of systems information or what have you, so that they can make um, quick diagnoses of what customers might be seeing and reach out to them before they realize that it's a problem. So this results in a debugging or uh, support experience that's not quite this, which is what most users are used to now um, and what you probably spend a lot of time doing. There's something that looks like this. So support engineers can go in and either create a personalized note or uh, an automated note that sends out um, a communication to our customers saying, we did either detected something and fixed it without you having to do anything, because we can fix the control plane as needed, or we give you a specific um, detail of something that might be off with your infrastructure that you can then go in and take care of. Do you have a question? It's more of a statement, if you, mm -hmm. if you don't mind me making it. Would you allow me to? Please do. I realized my math was wrong on that first statement uh, regarding the operational cost based on mm -hmm. kind of what you're talking about here, as well as my development costs. So w when I first built, put this team together, uh, I was lucky and Morph Labs had just gone under, an early, one of the early first OpenStack companies. Mm -hmm. And I picked up a couple of their core developers and uh, combined that with a really awesome DevOps manager uh, who had working for me. So I was lucky, based on my, my past location, Silicon Valley, that I was able to pull people from LA and Silicon Valley and others together to, to create that bud, create the team that created that platform in that budget. Right. If I was in the Midwest or if I was somewhere else away from a, a tech hub, uh, my cost to get this talent would have, would have been much higher um, and I most likely would not have, have had access. And, and that, I think the ROI and I, I'm, MSRP is a suggestion, obviously. Uh, but I, I think that return on investment, especially if, if you are, were, if a customer is outside of a tech hub and doesn't have a, a lot of uh, open source tech talent around, I think that that, that equation, uh, that that math, would swing a lot further in your favor. That that's a great point. Uh, cost is not just the the hiring of the team, but also the availability and finding of the people that would source that team. Well, exactly. I think uh, coming back to the operational side, uh, I think uh, Eamon Borstardo, he was um, the, the maintainer of Puppet OpenStack. And he worked in my organization and supported that. Um, he, he works for a, a company in Austin now, um, mm -hmm. as we all kind of moved on from that company. But 
There are skills that are very, very rare that require these intense operational skills that combine networking systems and storage skills together with modern software development methodologies which are incredibly hard to create. Exactly. And then combining that with being able to, when you find something's wrong and you need to submit a patch, uh, that takes about 18 months to 24 months of focused effort to be able to attain. And uh, just thinking of the ROI analysis of, of how you set your pricing on your product. And it, outside of a tech hub, I think your pricing is very fair. That's yeah. a great segue to my next point. So you spoke about uh, patches and, and updates. So we've heard many horror stories for people who've tried to upgrade OpenStack from one major version to another. And that takes anywhere from a few weeks to a few months if you're lucky. In, in a lot of cases, it just gets stuck in the hell of trying to upgrade. This is what an OpenStack upgrade with Platform 9 looks like, or for that matter, any of our other products. So because of the way we deliver our service, all you need to do is decide on when your 30-minute window exists for us to go in and do the forklift, and that's how the upgrade gets executed. Irrespective of whether we're trying to upgrade from an OpenStack major version to another OpenStack major version, or just delivering a few bug fixes or a few patches, this is what the upgrade experience to our customers looks like. It's 30 minutes, it's, it's predefined, we have all of the upgrade tooling that makes this a no-brainer, and that's how we manage all of our 150 plus regions in production. So question, how long would it be for a customer to, say, say right before a, a release, right? You, so they, a customer downloads, installs, got, gets a, the demo license, whatever, and they, they decide they like this, they put their credit card in, they sign the PO, they're now a customer. Mm -hmm. They get OpenStack installed and then deploy a web service to it using Fission. So they have something running that supports their business goals and an and a upgrade happens. That next day, they get the, 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 the uh, Tiri tags a release or release manager tags a release. And, you know, I guess not the next day, but the next day, sure. you are ready to release down into production. They have that next version waiting for them. Mm -hmm. How long does that take? How long does it take for us to deliver to them? Um, I would like to you to answer that question, but for them, when, when you have posted that release and when they are ready to upgrade, are you saying it's 30 minutes? So the way the upgrade works is that when we are ready to upgrade them, this is the kind of notice that gets sent out. So it's entirely up to them. We'll tell them we're ready whenever you are. Give us a 30-minute window. So it's, it's instantaneous. And to echo back, the cost would have been around 300K, plus I'm guessing about a quarter of that is maintenance going ongoing. For the, the math that Cody laid out earlier, yes. MSRP, and we all know how to negotiate off that to find the, a true win-win between all of us in that, right? Exactly. So it's interesting doing the cost of that, including upgrades. I mean, my, my team cost me about $1.4 million a year. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. They did other stuff. They had extra value. I'm sure. But a lot of companies are structured, so you have to have a team that operates on its own. And so just MSRP, that would have cost me 300K a year. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's it. Good job. <laughs> thank well you. done. Um, thank you. If you don't thank mind, you. I'd like it. to add on your, to your last point about sourcing the, the talent needed uh, to deliver something like this. So uh, our first flagship customer uh, was Box.net, right? Um, and we've talked about them in, in quite a few different webinars. Um, but their biggest issue wasn't that they couldn't get the talent, right? They're in the Bay Area. Um, that the talent wasn't good enough to do this work and all of that. It was that um, every time they sourced a team that had the skill set to deliver um, OpenStack, they got it up and running, and then the team got hired out from underneath them from the highest bidder. Yep. This happened to them three times. <laughs> and they said, we're done. We are no longer going to try to spend all this time and effort to source a team just to have our resources stolen from us. We don't want to be involved in this anymore. And that's why they came to us, was to solve that problem for them. So it's not, just, it's not even about sourcing the talent, training them, and getting it done. It's keeping them there as well as another. Uh, and, and it's a story we've talked in multiple webinars. So it's That simple discussion of you create value in someone and they have the freedom to go somewhere else, one, they do go through most as a reflection on how you're running your organization. Two, you are correct. That, that is a challenge. And I think it's really neat that a you know, business leader that is having challenges with retention, even if they have the talent available to them, can go ahead, sign a PO, yep. and I'm guessing in about an hour, 
have a, a fully managed, full, fully, exactly. uh, uh, fully upgradable, hands-off, low headache what's place the, to run their applications. What's the record for how quickly you've gotten a customer set up? It's less than an hour, right? Uh, 19 minutes? 17 minutes. 17 minutes. I was able to get a customer from just having basic Linux installed on their CentOS, uh, up and running and deploying VMs in 17 minutes. Thank you. So this brings us to the end of our presentation content. Um, if there's one takeaway that I want you all to walk away from this, is that not only do we have uh, products across every stage of that infrastructure evolution that we laid out, but we're also there to help customers who want to make the transition from one stage to another. So it kind of future-proofs you in a way in terms of uh, making sure that we're there even if you're not quite ready to move to the next stage yet. So before we close, I'll hand over back to Rupak for a special announcement that he has. But a quick point that I'll um, bring up just before we do that. All of the, the data that we've laid out in terms of how we deliver a SaaS managed solution, in terms of how we upgrade it, in terms of how we monitor it, is reflected in, in something we're very proud of, and that's our net promoter score. Now, the, the caveat here is that it's a very small sample size. We haven't been running our net promoter score for as long as VMware or AWS has. But this is kind of how it stacks up. Um, and we, we take it as a great validation of the kind of work that we're doing, the kind of value that our products provide, and, and the way they're built from the ground up. I have a quick question about sure. the, the upgrades. Um, so that was an email that's sent out to a customer uh, can they postpone or reschedule from within the, the, the management software that you have within the SaaS portal? So the way this is done today um, is that we, it, it's, a, it's a conversation. We don't allow them to do it through the management portal itself because that's, again, some work that they need to do. But they can definitely respond to this and tell us, okay, this is not a good time. We can do it sometime later. So I guess the issue that ends up being is if you're sending this email to a team, we have a distribution list, and, and the entire team could theoretically respond or think that someone else will handle it. However, if it was in the management console, you'd be able to say, you know, delay or pick a better time. and then we that's, can just, So you can see it in there without having to rely on email. That's exactly right. And that's what we're building as part of our management platform as we speak. I was just being transparent in terms of where okay. we are today. All right, if there are no more questions, I'll hand back to Rupak quickly. Thanks, Amrish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shamwal. There, there's, there's more, and so I was going to talk about one thing, but I'm going to talk about two new things. So um, if you can join me, and I want to showcase uh, two things today. One is if, you, if all of you can go to platform9.com, I want you to, um, and you don't have to do it right now, but I would really like and encourage you to try our sandbox experience. Um, our sandbox experience. So you click on this, put in an email address, a password, you'll get a link, go in, and you can play with our product, both OpenStack and managed Kubernetes, which is hosted. It's a timed um, setup. I think it's four hours, 12 hours? hours 12, 24, 24 hours now. So we have 24 hours for you to play with it, but, but that's, a, that's a, a setup which is shared by many people. So you can try that on both, our, uh, both the products. I would really encourage you to try it. I know there will be a lot of interest on the OpenStack side, so please go ahead. The announcement uh, that I wanted to make was on the Kubernetes side. So we spoke about how Kubernetes is uh, you know, really a developer-led movement cloud native applications. Um, we serve to enterprises. They want to create big clusters. But a lot of developers really, are, uh, really want to play with it. There are startups who just want three node cluster. And that's enough for them, because that's what their applications demand. So to help them, we, have, we are creating, um, and it's not out yet. This is the first time we are talking about is a new service called as kubetogo.io, once it comes up. You need to be on the VPN. Check the VPN. Check the VPN. Uh, yes, thank you. Yep. Hopefully the VPN's working again. So it's not public. That's why I need to be on VPN. OK, here it is. So in just a few clicks, you can register yourself. It's completely free for up to five nodes. 
and or you can sign in uh, once you create your account. So this is what I'm going to do. So you sign in, and it's going to throw you at a page where you can start creating clusters on your public cloud of your choice. It's a free service again, five nodes at maximum for you to try it out and, and keep it. So if you're using it, you can keep it. But if you're not using it, we will we'll take it back. Uh, this is not out in public, but I'm talking about it. I know a bunch of you are interested in containers. So if you want to create Kubernetes clusters, this is the fastest way to go. Please do try it. And also, please try Sandbox. I may have missed the link, but how, how are we getting to this now? So this is not out yet. OK. Uh, this is just a pre-announcement that we are making. It would be out soon. Uh, but uh, I would be happy to send out emails to you if you're, if, if you're interested. I would definitely like you to try our Sandbox experience to really play with the product. It's a whole product available for you 24, uh, for 24 hours. Well, that's all I had. Yeah, um, and this will be at cube2go.io. Yes, thank you. Right, once it's live. Yes. This is a Tech Field Day exclusive for now. Now we have 15 minutes left. Uh, any statements, comments, questions? <clears throat> I actually had tried your sandbox before we got here. Oh, great. It is a fantastic service. Yeah. Um, thank you. Any vendor who puts out their, their stuff to try without me having to install in my home lab, is, I'll appreciate that and I love yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. I don't have my head around OpenStack as much as I would like, but I still was able to get in there and spin some stuff up and play with it. Oh, great to hear that. And, and send the feedback if, if something's not working or you'd like to see more, we'd be happy to add that to it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I've had multiple people I know from multiple countries around the world uh, tell me that Platform 9 is worth looking at. And, you know, of course, I have many things I have to attend to in my, in my life and business. And this is the first time that I've been able to see the demo. I'm kind of lucky, fortunate, that, you've been able, that I was able to see it from you. I think they were recommending I looked at it for a very good reason. Thank you. R Rupak wasn't kidding when he said we're fanatical about our customers. I'm sorry.